Okay. <clears throat> if you have been around Cross Point for a while, you will find out that missions for us is a really big deal. And it's a really big deal around here because it's a really big deal to God. If you read the Bible, you'll see right from the opening chapters of the book of Genesis where God speaks to a man named Abram at that time, changing his name to Abraham, that he blessed him so that he would be a blessing to the nations. As you continue to read, you see God's working through the nations as we go all the way to John 3.16. So God so loved the what? World. World. That he gave his one and only son. We'll see in Jesus' final words in the Great Commission that we're we're called to go and to make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything that Jesus taught us. We're baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and He will be with us into the end of the age. We'll see in the New Testament as you continue to read the book of Acts, where this is the story of the church as it is spread out into the nations. Most of the letters of the epistles of the New Testament, <laughs> New Testament were written by missionaries, by the way. Apostles who were going into the nations. And then in the final book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, we see a scene like this which is recorded in chapter 7. This is where this is all heading. We see a great multitude that no one can number. Just put that in your mind's eye. In that group... It's people from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and all languages, are standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb. The world... The nations are important to God. Let that sink in from the opening pages of creation to its final chapters and revelations. All of the nations are in view. So missions is a big deal around here. And it's woven into our very DNA as our mission statement, as our purpose statement. I referenced it last week. I'll reference it again. We exist to bring about the obedience of faith. We talked about it last week. For the sake of His name, Christ's name, God's glory. Among all the nations. I hope as you are connected to Christ and you are connected to this body that that DNA is interwoven with your spiritual DNA. That we recognize that the nations matter to God. And it's evidenced by our purpose statement. It's also evidenced in our church by our intentional giving to missions out of our general budget At at least 10% plus, we want to move more. We do that intentionally. Missions is a big deal as it's evidenced by our sending and supporting long-term missionaries and regularly sending short-term teams. It's evidenced by our regularly taking time in our Sunday morning services. And we got a lot packed into these services. Intentionally making space so that we can highlight and focus on and welcome and hear from various missions agencies and missionaries that we support. This is evidenced around here by our partnership with our Myanmar congregation in this building. 
It's evidenced by the time and the efforts and the energy that we are pouring into the Welcome Corps, which you have heard about and will hear more about, where we are looking to bring to this country refugees that are scattered, about 30 of them, hopefully more, that we have capacity to take in. We are looking to do these things. It's evidenced by our missions wall, which is right out over there where we list our missionaries. It's evidenced by our prayers during our Sunday morning services and our weekly prayer meetings as we pray for our missionaries. It's evidenced by our GO team, which is a global outreach team which focuses on missionary care and concerns. My prayer is that we would always have this heart because it's God's heart. My prayer is that we would grow stronger, that we would be more generous, more risky in the sense of giving ourselves over to what God is doing, not just in our neighborhood, but also in the nations. I pray that our giving capacity or our going or our sending capacity will grow so that the nations will be glad. My hope is even in this message that this scripture passage that we're going to examine today, scripture itself would penetrate your mind, that you would think about these things. You would pray in this way. You would give this way. You would send this way, that you would go in this way. That is my heart because I believe it is God's heart. So we're turning to our passage in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 19. If you have a Bible, go ahead, open it up. And I want to remind us what Paul has been instructing to us, to the church in Philippians, to us as well, how we are to walk as citizens of heaven, that we are to use our lives And we are to follow Jesus Christ as our primary example. That we would have, indeed, His Christ's mindset. And we would live this out practically in our lives as well. Such as, we've talked about last week, doing everything without complaining or arguing as we follow in the footsteps of obedience of faith as Christ did. In our passage for this morning, the Apostle Paul, the missionary Paul, gives us two more examples of his ministry partners for us to consider as examples as well. He will also go on later to use his own life as we continue to read through Philippians as an example for us to follow. This is not for just, quote-unquote, professional Christians. By the way, there are no professional Christians. They're just children of Jesus Christ or children of Jesus Christ. We are to consider these things. And my hope is that you would consider these things. Why it matters. How we can partner. Why it makes a difference. So we're going to look at that through this passage this morning. How can we, excuse me, who should we send as our uh, missionaries and our messengers? And how can we be one of them? And I want you to think about that. Second, I want us to think about how we should practically partner with our missionaries. And third, and finally, how should we partner? How, how, what should we do? So I hope to provide not just what to do, but why we are to do it, so that this again would inform us, that would influence us, it would transform us to what God is doing in the world. So here's the first question I'm asking that the text answers. Number one, who should we send? Not everybody goes, not everybody should go. 
But this text helps us to understand the characteristics of people that we are looking to send as missionaries or as messengers, short-term missionaries. So again, Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 19, and we're going to go through these two paragraphs together. Paul writes then, I hope in the Lord Jesus, right? This is after he just talked to us. He says, hey, now I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. He is a messenger going back and forth from Paul to the church in Philippi. Verse 20, Paul says, I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. Go ahead and just underline that if you have a device or a physical Bible that you can do so. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. So this is the first thing we see as to answer the question, who shall we send? Send people who show genuine concern for the people. So let's talk about Timothy a little bit. Perhaps you do not know who this man is. We run into him as Paul is traveling on his first missionary journey in Acts chapter 16. He was a young man stationed in a place called Lystra, and he had, um, let's see, a mixed heritage. His mother was a Jew, and his father was a non-Jew. But he was a devout young man, devout in the ways of Christ. And the city there, the church there, spoke well of this young man. As Paul was traveling through, then after, you know, whatever, a period of time understanding who he is, he invited Timothy to travel with him throughout Asia and doing this missionary work of evangelism, establishing churches and raising leaders. By the way, later on, Timothy is installed is, as a pastor in the church of Ephesus, and there's two letters in the New Testament written to this young man, 1st and 2nd Timothy. Paul says that he has no one else like him. He was there with them as Paul was in prison, and he wanted to send Timothy to Philippi. Why? Because Timothy genuinely cared, genuinely cared for the welfare of that church in a distant city, about 800 hundred miles away from Rome. Now, in describing Timothy's character, he says, you know what, he had general, genuine concern for your welfare. Timothy was not a missionary tourist, okay? You know what that is? It's kind of a phenomenon that's been happening probably the last 25 or more years that Christians think it's a good idea to go to, say, Costa Rica, not someplace too far away, and experience a a culture, do some good works. Often it's just simple things like painting, which I've been on those missions trips before, doing some things, and then returning home. Often I hear from people, and this is as a reflection, boy, I'm so glad for what I have, which is not a bad thing, and boy, I'm glad that I don't live there, which kind of makes me pause. What I want to hear is, God, thank you for your work that you are doing in the rest of the world. God, how can I genuinely, I can't say that word, genuinely care for those people? It's one thing to be curious about another culture, right? And I've been probably in 20 different mission trips over my 30 plus years of being a Christian, It's one thing for being curious. It's another thing to have genuine concern for the welfare of people. So what does genuine concern look like? It's about thinking about the people that you are connected to in a different place or people that you are connected to here, right? That you think about what is most needed, and how can I meet those needs? 
That means following up and making phone calls and making sure things are okay. If you have genuine concern for a friend of yours who is bailing out their basement right now, that means you call them, is things okay? And you hear, oh, it's not okay. It means you go over there with a shop vac. It means you go over there and you empty out the house. It means you go over there a week from now and help them to clean up their drywall and make sure that things are checked in because you genuinely care for their welfare. You just don't care about doing something good. You actually care about the person. By the way, there's a difference, okay? This is what this means. You take on their burdens and their issues as your own. There's not an us-they mentality, but a us mentality. Do you understand this? A genuine concern is shown by going and giving, and getting involved, and becoming, here's the word, inner meshed, right? Like you take two pieces of fabric and you weave them together, that one is connected to the other, and you can't necessarily differentiate one from the other. Timothy had this genuine concern. I think of the Delameters, which this church, by the way, has sent out. They went to a remote place in Kenya. When I say remote, it is like three miles out of the major city. It is miles and miles and miles away away from any um, populous mass, okay? They're miles away. In the middle of nowhere to a people group called the Maasai, And they bought, quote-unquote, acreage, and they called it a farm, okay? It was brush. It was trees. It was a whole lot of dirt in the middle of nowhere. Why did they do that? Brian and Heather had it pretty nice here, right? Like things like mm, electricity and (laughs) running water. And mm, a language that they actually knew and people that they grew up with, right? And a Walmart right around the corner, wherever they shopped. Why? Because God cares for the nations. Now, they went there not just to, you know, erect a monument to themselves. We were here. Look at how great they, we are. They didn't do that. Month after month, and now year after new year, cleaning and clearing the land, getting to know the people around, going to their homes that often are one-room huts that have been erected typically by the females of this tribe because the males are out with their tribes or want, excuse me, with their animals wandering around, and the females are there, and they make their homes, I've been in these homes, by taking a mixture of mud, straw, and animal droppings. Not kidding you, putting them together, getting sticks, making a place, making the walls. And then for cooking, there is a fire in the middle. Kids often in that community fall into the fire. Burns are a big deal. Why? In the middle of the night, you're sleeping, it's dark or whatever, you trip, you go over the edge of something, you're playing, and you fall into the fire. This happens a lot. As they were there, they saw all of these needs from clean water to education to medical care, to jobs and opportunities, to pastoral training for these local pastors, and they started and continued to work. Why? Because they care about the people. They come in and asking for help because of a a sickness or a disease, and they try to help, and they try to not just provide aid, but give hope. Do you hear me, right? transform people because there's a genuine care for the people. We send people who genuinely care. I look for people in this congregation 
who aren't here trying to get a position, but are here because they want to make a difference for Christ. Right? They serve here, and we're going to get into that. So we look to send people who genuinely care for the welfare of those in which we are sending them to. Not care for them mentally, but actually care for them physically, economically, spiritually, emotionally. This is who we send. Now, Paul continues to describe this young man, Timothy, who genuinely cares for other people and says this in verse 21. For everyone looks out for their own interests, but not those of Jesus Christ. Now that should be a little stinging. Right? You say, well, of course not me. right? And perhaps it is not you. But I want us to think about this. This is people who we are looking to send. Send people who look out for the interests of Jesus Christ. Now, do we have a responsibility to look out for our own interests? Yes, right? We do. As a matter of fact, Paul told us in the beginning of this chapter to look out for our own interests. He told us. But he says also we have a responsibility to look out for the needs of other people as well. And also to that focus of interest is this expanding thought of the interests of Jesus Christ. Do you think about what Jesus is most interested in? Do you think about that? Your response probably is, well, of course it's me, right? Does Jesus care about you? Absolutely. And he cares about your neighbor. And he cares about our nation. And he cares about the world, right? He has an agenda. He has a pathway. He has a plan. He has the power. And he's just looking for somebody to say, here I am, Lord, send me. Now, you may not go to Kenya, but you surely can go across this block. Right? Do we, do I, and we are taking on our own interests, yes, but don't limit yourself to these interests. If all of the arrows of your life, your relationships, your community, your workplace, if you're going to school, if all of them point to you, okay, you become like a black hole where you just suck everything in and no light escapes. If the arrows of our life are pointed outward, then we shine like the stars of the universe. You understand that? Which we're called to do. We come to Christ for us, but we have to recognize it's not just about us. Right? We take it in so we can shine outward. So what is it for you? I want to encourage you to pray like this. I tell you a lot of times trying to help us to pray. Pray. Pray about your own interests and then ask a question. Jesus, what are you most interested today? And then listen. And then read and observe. And then ask a question and say, God, will you help me as I'm going about my business to expand my sphere to be interested in what you are most interested in today? And sometimes my interests are not Jesus' interests. And guess who needs to change their focus? Me. You. I'm asking you, the scripture asks us, to focus this way. I've been in India, done pastoral training with a pastor named Emmanuel. Check out his name, Emmanuel Pastor. That's his name. Been into his house, small house, concrete walls, right? Patio outside. Every night, Emmanuel takes in the orphans of his community, and they sleep like sardines in two rooms. Been there, talked to them, seen it. 
Now, he doesn't have to do that. Why does he do that? Because he's concerned about the interests of Jesus Christ. Emmanuel and his crew of crackpot missionaries, there's a right around the corner in about mm, three hours away, there's this mountain range. And I was talking to him. He says, that's our mountain range. He says, the people in these villages have no idea who Jesus is. And so they go every weekend into the mountains on these little scooters carrying projectors and carrying the gospel to plant churches. They said, this is our mountain range. It is inconvenient. It is hot. It is difficult. They're in danger. They do this week in and week out, not to build their name, but to proclaim the name that's above every name. They care about the interests of Jesus. Lost people matter to God. If you go to my office, which is right behind this wall, and my coffee table, I have a book that says Holy Bible on the cover. I have many of those, but right on my coffee table, there's a special one. If you open it up, and you're looking for a certain passage, you will find blank page after blank page after blank page after blank page. Did someone forget to print this? No, it's a reminder for me and everyone who comes into my office that this is the Bible that some people have. Nothing. It's not okay that I have shelf after shelf after shelf of Bibles in my office and some people have zero. I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay, and I'm, well, okay, I'll just let it go. I gotta keep moving. I'm just not okay that I have 1,500 books probably in my library. They're probably giving away 500 more or plus. And next week, I'm going to go see pastor friends. Know how many books they have? Zero. I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay where I've had class after class and credit after credit all the way up to the doctorate to, to, to receive training well, they have very limited access to any type of training. I am not okay with that. God doesn't love me or you any more or any less than he loves those in Kenya or Indonesia or India or Russia. Send people who look out for the interests of Jesus Christ. Now let's continue to read. Who are we sending? I need another two hours. <laughs> trying to move, trying to move. Let's continue to read. 22, this is Paul describing who to send. And he says now about Timothy, but you know that Timothy has proved himself, underline proved himself, how? Because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I'm confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. This is the next characteristic of someone where people were looking to send. Send people who have proved themselves. By the way, we just don't send anybody and everybody, Okay? I want to make sure that this person loves the community here. I want to make sure that this person is um, um, serving here. Paul is talking about that. I'm sending Timothy, and he serves with me as a son to a father, which tells me that he's loyal, that he's loving, that he's committed. He says that he does the work, and he serves. So he's a worker, and he's a servant. Okay? I look for people that have those characteristics. You say, well, I want to go serve in short-term missions or long-term missions, okay? Now, okay, let's see what's happening right now. Here's my first thing. What are you doing right now? Well, I'll do it when I get there, wherever there is. If you're not doing it here, that means you won't do it there, okay? Get going now. Do what you can here and now. And if you don't have a genuine concern for people in this congregation, you need to do two things. 
Repent, and you need to pray that God, God, give me a genuine concern for people here. You know why? Because God does, and he's happy to give that to you as well. And then I want you to see beyond that. God, help me to be this type of person. Timothy was proved. I have been in places in the world in which some missionaries I respect and others I would probably reject. Okay. I remember in a couple churches ago we had missionaries coming back from Costa Rica. Come to find out that they're embezzling money. Come to find out that they were um, bullies in their community. Come to find out the, um, uh, the male of this couple was abusing children. And there had been missionaries for years and years and years. Talk to some of our missionaries here. They'll tell you both stories of honor and, and stories of dishonor. We look for people who have been proved, have a proven track record, have been vetted. We're looking for these characteristics of love and loyalty, of servant-heartedness, of working for the gospel, of being teachable, being people who work, who give energy and effort, and focus on finishing what they started on and on and on and on. These are people who we should send i got to keep moving. Okay, second question. <laughs> How should we partner? Right. So Paul, the missionary, is sending, sending a messenger, another missionary out, which is incredible to me. So we have to ask ourselves, well, how should we partner with our missionaries? Verse 25 of Philippians 2. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, okay? my brother, my co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, who you sent to take care of my needs. Okay, if you understand, Epaphroditus was sent by the church in Philippi. He was sent with supplies. He was sent with money. He was sent to encourage the missionary Paul on the ground, right? By the way, if you want a scripture passage that justifies short-term missions, it's Epaphroditus right here, right? Sent out to encourage, to help. Sent out with gear and money to help, to encourage and support. So what we are to do, you see this, whom we sent to, number one, take care of my needs. How we can help our uh, missionaries is to take care of their needs. Okay? This is our personal travel expenses. This is our personal housing. This is the personal um, medical care and so on. We have a responsibility to take care of other people's needs, right? And this man, which Paul describes in these glowing terms as a brother, right? Someone who he loves, as a co-worker, someone who works, as a fellow soldier that's standing next to him looking to make a difference, to advance the gospel. Also a messenger to communicate things. He came to take care of needs, we need to take care of our missionaries' needs. And all the missionaries right now are saying amen to that, right? Know their needs. Talk to them more than just, you know, pictures. And yeah, we have missionaries somewhere. And by the way, if I asked, I just came up there in the service, say, hey, please name three missionaries that we support. How many of you will be able to do that? I'm going to help you with that. <laughs> There's missionary names in the back of the sermon notes. There is a bookmark that you can grab with all of our missionaries. There is a more fuller printout with um, faces and places and website information that you can click on. If we can't name more than three or more than five missionaries, we have to do better, friends. Right? We have to do better. We have a responsibility to take care of their needs, in particular those we sent out, including the Delameters. And there will be others that we will send out from this place by the grace of God. We have a responsibility to take care of their needs. Now, let's continue to read. I have other things in the notes 
Go ahead and read them. Tomorrow. <laughs> or this afternoon. Verse 26. Right? So he's describing Epaphroditus, right? Epaphroditus. And he says this, For he longs for all of you. Right? There's this love for the people that he was sent from. And he is distressed because you heard he was ill. They didn't have instant communication, right? They were distressed because they heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill. And he almost died. But God had mercy on him. And not only on him only, but also on me. To spare me, Paul is saying, sorrow upon sorrow. He really loved this guy. Paul says, therefore, I am all the more eager to send him back to you so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. (laughs) So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him. There it is. Because he almost died for the work of who? Christ. Not the work of the Philippians, not the work of Paul, but the work of Christ. So what are we to do? How should we partner? We take care of the needs of our missionaries. Second, welcome and honor our missionaries. <laughs> our missionaries have taken on the interest of Christ Jesus and answered the call to missions in the nations of the world. And at times, it is daunting. At times, it is dangerous. At times, it is depressing. They have sorrows. They experience loss. They have concerns. They have connections, not just in the host country or area, but throughout the world and challenges on all sides, both without and also within. It is tough. And they spend their lives and sometimes lose their lives for the sake of of Christ. Talk to the harnesses who are, there's Dan right there, who have been missionaries. Talk to the blacks who have seen this. Talk to Paul Marie Schrader, wherever they are, somewhere in here. Talk to, um, talk to Ann Britt and others. They understand these troubles. What are we to do? We're to honor people like them and welcome them with great joy. Often we see missionaries as weirdos, right? Right? They wear like African clothes, right? And someone yeah, is getting patting Jim in the back of the, 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 the shoulders, right? Why would you do that, right? They act kind of weird and kind of awkward. They don't necessarily go away and you live in Nigeria for years and years and years. You come back and everything's kind of strange. You kind of feel a stranger in your home country, Right? When we have missionaries come to us, this would be great. We'd have a welcoming line, like, or like a parade after they win the Super Bowl, right? Could you imagine that? Yay! Cheering them on like they just came back from World War II as heroes. You understand that type of welcome, right? Why don't we do that? Why don't we invite them in our home and ask them questions? Why don't we celebrate them? Why isn't that when they come here and often they come here empty that they would leave full? Their hearts would be full. Their minds would be full. Their spirits would be full. And their pockets would be full. That's how I want us to respond to missionaries who come here. I don't want to hear stories. Like Jim Black told me, and he doesn't know I'm telling this story, that they are now going back to Nigeria, right? We just had breakfast a couple weeks ago, and I was asking how he's doing, and he's traveling. That's why he's not currently, currently, see how I said this, on our shepherding team, because he has to be at different places. How is it going? He says, well, just a couple weeks ago, I hope these people don't watch this video. I hope they do watch this video. A couple weeks ago, he he went up to uh, North Dakota, right? South Dakota, up to Dakotas. Took his car, drove up there, took the time, spent, spent the money, spent $500 as a missionary to go to this church. Ministered there in the morning, talked to the people, and left home with zero. On Jim's fundraising trip, 
he lost $500 and a weekend away, right? That will not happen here. And I say that because that's our heart. I say that I'm asking. When they come, we want to send them away full, right? Because they're empty a lot of the times. Been there, seen it. It's hard. When the Delameters come back, you should invite them over to your house every day and feed them good food and tuck them in at night. Hear the stories, listen to what they've done. Welcome them with joy and honor people like this. I would love to have a ticker tape parade for our missionaries, and maybe someday we'll do that. Help meet their needs. Honor them, support them, love them, fill them to the brim, both their hearts and their pockets. Last thing in this section, verse 30, talking about Epaphroditus, he risked his life. He did. And often our missionaries and our messengers do this. <laughs> risked his life. Why? To make up for the help you yourselves, the church in Philippi, could not give me. This is the last thing under this point. Provide help to our missionaries. Now, this is different than meeting their needs. Okay. Should we meet their needs? Absolutely. And the help we're talking about, they're not there. They're, they're in Kenya right now watching this, right? There's no church in English that they can go to. There's no worship team with microphones at work, right? There's no congregation per se. It's growing, and people are growing, and things are growing, right? Rapidly grateful for that. But they're not, we're not there, right? And not everybody can go, and not everybody should go. So we send people, like our team that we're going to commission in just a moment. We send, well, two moments. <laughs> Got another point. We send people, why? To help give them support and encouragement. This is why we're going to encourage them. We're going on Monday. Three of us, Holly is already there. We are lugging about 500 pounds of stuff across the world. That's not fun, nor is it easy, right? Spending money, putting it in here. You guys helped us to go, and you've given us money to go. Couldn't do it without you, right? They are to encourage them, to supply them, to listen to them, to pray for them, to hug them, to experience all of these things, to help encourage the teachers that are teaching, help encourage the staff who is there, help encourage the pastors. And I hope with a seminary there to bring Bibles and to bring books and to help encourage them. This is support. This is beyond need. It's helping them to do the work of the ministry. And Paul was saying, hey, honor this guy and thank him because he gave me the help you could not give. This is why we go, okay? So we're going to help rectify things that we're not okay with. We're going to make a difference because God cares for the nations of the world. Right? If you haven't got outside of this country, and this is my challenge for you, not everybody can do that because of finances, because of physical limitations, okay, because of obligations here, I get this. But I want to challenge us as a congregation to get outside of America to see what the majority of the world lives, what it's like, who they are, what their needs is, to make a difference for the gospel. Don't just go to Cancun to a five-star resort and say, well, I did missions. You didn't. You went on a vacation? Bless you. That's okay. Vacations are okay, right? They are. But go stay in someone's mud hut for a week. Tell me how that is. Go sleep on the floor with six other guys on concrete where cockroaches are literally walking over you at night. Go lay some blocks and get an amoeba in your stomach and be sick for three days. There are dangers. <laughs> there are things. Not all places in the world are as cush as we have it here. Cush? Yeah, you have a pretty cush. Why do you say that? You have running water. Does anyone here not have running water? Oh, everybody does? Oh, okay. 
Do you all have more than one set of clothes? Or, or don't you? I can help you if you need some. You understand these things and understand the rest of the world where we're going to Kenya? The average wage is $5, not an hour, a day. And that's good income. When I was in India, it's a dollar a day. And you are working 12 hours a day in a rice field, bent over all day long, either harvesting or planting rice every day, all day. To come home, to sleep and eat some of the rice, to get up and do it tomorrow for the rest of your life. And that's some of the good stories. God expand our reach. God, help us to provide help for the missionaries, okay? That's enough on that. Already running along. Why should we partner with our missionaries, okay? This is the last thing. And then we're going to pray, okay? I'm going to go all the way to Philippians chapter 4 near the end of this book, right? I'm stealing from that sermon to put it in here because it's appropriate, okay? We'll break it down in pieces then, but now we have to look at this. So Paul is getting ready to, to sign off to the Philippians, and then he says these things in verse 14. Paul says, Yet it was good for you, this is the Philippians, to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I sent out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except only you. That's like mind-blowing, that Paul only had one church that was supporting him. This was the Apostle Paul, right? This is a new church plant that says, we are going to help support you in your ministry. No other church did this, only these guys. Verse 16. For even when I was in uh, Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not, verse 17, that I desire gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your count. And that is mind-blowing circle, that. I've received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, including paying for his prison sentence. He had to pay for his prison sentence, pay for the food he ate, pay for all of those things. They sent it. He couldn't do it. He sent it. It says, these things are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. This is a whole other sermon that I'm not going to preach. But know that it's good for you to share in the troubles of missionaries. Know it's good for us. It helps us loosen our grip on our stuff. Here's the deal. You have too much stuff. And there's silence in the room, okay? You're an American. I know you. You know why? Because I am you, right? I have too much stuff. Every year, wouldn't it be great, okay, and often we, we, the focus is on our garage sale for missions, wouldn't it be great that we would fill that place to capacity from stuff that you have in your basement that you haven't looked at in a decade? Or, better yet, something you have too much of. Or, even better yet, something of value that you are sacrificing for the gospel's sake. I can't think that in heaven we're going to wish that we had just one more spoon for your collection. Come on. Pray for my wife. I have a spoon. I have a spoon collection. I like what Paul said here, right right near the end. Um, He said, "Hey, I, I more desire what's." Credited to your account. Oh, well, what is he talking about here? This is about storing treasures in heaven. Jesus told us to do that, right? It's in there. I think it's uh, Matthew 6. Is that what it is? Matthew 6. Jesus says, Store for yourself treasures for heaven where neither moth or rust or thieves take or steal or destroy. By the way, that's not a suggestion, it's a command. How do you do that? (laughs) By giving your stuff now. You're not taking it with you. 
You can send it on ahead. God says, I see you. I see that sacrifice. I see that check you wrote that had an extra zero on it or whatever. Very wisest of people think long term, and I'm asking you to think to the various, the very, very long term, which is eternity. Think about that. What matters most then? Paul says, hey, this is an opportunity to you for you to invest in eternity. And I want your eternity to be overflowing, whatever that is and whatever that looks like. This is what Paul is saying. And so we shouldn't be ashamed to ask for opportunities to give. What will be accredited to your account. This is not manipulation, and please hear me. You benefit. It is good for you to do this. It loosens your soul from how it's been shrunk by our consumption and our self-indulgence so often. God, help us to be this way. So meet the needs of the missionaries. Honor them. Help them. It's a fragrant offering to God. It's an acceptable sacrifice, and it means at times you sacrifice. And it pleases God. If you want to please God, then give and go and send and pray and have concern. Open your heart. This is the deal. Amen to that.